journalists are known for their scoops, and he has many. To name just two, apropos to our topic today, he was the first American journalist to conduct a one-on-one -on -one interview with then-Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev, and the only American news anchor to report from the scene the night the Berlin Wall fell. A journalist, historian, and among the leading figures in American public life during the Reagan presidency, we could not have found anyone better to start and lead tonight's program on biography and legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Tom Brokaw. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let me at the outset apologize for my tardiness. I do have what Governor Wilson says is an acceptable excuse. <laughs> when uh, it was announced about two weeks ago that I would be coming here to the Presidential Library, I had a call from Mrs. Reagan. And she said, I'd like you to take me to lunch. And so I said, I'd absolutely like to take you to lunch. We stay in touch over the years. And then I said, would you like me to invite anyone else? Your friend Warren Beatty. She said, oh, no, you'll, you'll be fine. And, <laughs> and the next day, she called me back, and she said, well, if you weren't kidding, it'd be fun to have Warren there. <laughs> so Warren, Nancy, and I have just finished a long, wonderful lunch. And there are a lot of stories, some of which I can share with you, others I cannot, actually. <laughs> and um, I feel this familial attachment to this library and to the Reagan family for a variety of reasons. One is that 45 years ago, this spring, for reasons that are still not entirely clear to me, I was hired by NBC to come to the NBC News Bureau in Burbank. I was just a couple of years out of Yankton, South Dakota, having worked briefly in Omaha, then very briefly in Atlanta, and they brought me to Los Angeles. And in the infinite wisdom of the news editor at the time, he said, kid, we're going to let you start with this guy, Reagan, who thinks he's going to get nominated for governor. We don't think he's going anywhere, but you'll get to know, <laughs> you'll get to know California a little bit, and you'll be able to ride around with him. I thought in some ways that it was a perfect fit, because I, too, was a product of America's heartland. I grew up in South Dakota with Ronald Reagan in many ways on Saturday afternoons at the matinees and in the movies that he made. And we have this kind of Midwestern, I suppose, pride in all the success that he'd had. We were aware of his roots in Illinois and his first job at WHO in Des Moines, Iowa. And then I went to Omaha, and he was a fairly regular visitor to that part of the world as part of the GE circuit. And I began to learn something about him and my first encounters with him. He was, I have always felt, and I have believed forever that this was a key to his success, a pure product of Main Street, Heartland America. He even looked the part. And people were comfortable with him from the very beginning. When they saw him, they could say to themselves, well, he's like one of us. And he was in his symbolic appearances on the big screen and as a spokesman for the General Electric Theater. But in my first encounters with him, I learned something else about him. He was a man of enormous private reserve. He had a, almost a shield around him that he could be very engaging when you were talking to him, but you only got so close. That came as a little bit of a surprise to those of us in the Midwest when we first met him because we're a pretty friendly lot. We kind of expect everybody to be just like us. But when Ronald Reagan walked into the studios in Omaha, he had a real presence. He was immaculately turned out. I always remember that. He had this wonderful wardrobe, and he was every inch a movie star. And he sat down uh, to be interviewed, and everything was done very correctly. And then as I was telling Nancy today, I had this unusual personal moment. This was a long time ago, you must remember, and contact lenses were not that popular in those days. And I looked up, and the light caught his eye in such a way that I could tell that he was wearing contact lenses. And up to that point, everything had been very correct. 
and almost formal in our exchanges about the interview that I was about to do with him. And I almost blurted out, Mr. Reagan, are you wearing contact lenses? <laughs> and he got quite animated. And he said, I am, and they're the great new soft lens types. And he, I said, well, no, you don't have to take them out and show them to me. That's OK. <laughs> I said, but my wife wears contact lenses, and she was one of the early wearers of contact. And I said, she's having a little, oh, he said, let me write down the name of my doctor in California, and you can call him and find out where to get these new contact lenses. And I, in fact, uh, took the note home, and we always referred to Meredith's early contact lenses later as the President Reagan contact lenses. <laughs> but there were not a lot of moments like that, in fact, in which he would let down, especially with the press, or people that he didn't know. He did have this enormous reserve, and it was, I always felt, a combination that served him well because he always knew who he was and what he wanted out of any given situation. And at the same time, when he walked into a room or appeared on a stage, we felt almost instantly at ease with his demeanor and his familiarity because we had known him in these other capacities for so long. Moreover, in those days, uh, it was very clear how gifted he was and how at ease he was with making a public speech or telling a story in front of an audience, how much he enjoyed it. You turn the clock back a little bit and you realize that this had been a large part of his whole life. He was of Irish stock after all and he had worked in radio and in those days a lot of radio was very improvisational. He learned how to be at ease when he was speaking to audiences either in person or with a microphone. And then, of course, there were those famous stories about how he would recreate the Chicago Cubs baseball teams by just reading the ticker. And that developed within him a capacity, I felt strongly, that later served him so well when he began to run for office, first here in California, and then, of course, on the national stage. By the time he got to that place where the rest of the country was beginning to see him as a presidential candidate, there was no more gifted platform performer than Ronald Reagan. He knew how to tell just the right story at the right time. He had the quick response to anyone who challenged him in some fashion. And he made us all comfortable with his style because it was in that folksy Iowa radio way language that almost everyone could understand. Moreover, he would invoke the images of America, a city on the hill, his childhood in Illinois, that I think a lot of people in the 60s especially longed to have come true for them again. Now, you all know about his days with General Electric, and some of you may be familiar with what was often thought of as his seminal political speech, which was in 1964 at the end of the Republican campaign. Barry Goldwater was the nominee. Wasn't going well against Lyndon Johnson. It turned out to be a big landslide against him. Ronald Reagan made a speech in the closing days, a national speech on behalf of Barry Goldwater and the Republican presidential candidate. And most historians, and I'm sure those people in the front row here agree, it was a big breakthrough speech for him. That's when the rest of the country really began to pay attention outside of the GE circuit in terms of his political bones, if you will, and his ambitions and aspirations. Mrs. Reagan told me today something I'd not heard before, and we'll ask our panel later about whether they'd heard it. She said that speech almost didn't come off, that they were in the room, he was prepared to give it, and the Goldwater apparatchiks were not happy with the content of the speech. And they said, we don't think this is going to work for a national audience. And he said, it's worked, fellas, pretty well so far for me all over the country. And Nancy said, it almost didn't happen. And then she, in an aside, said today, I wonder what would have happened to Ronnie if he hadn't given that speech. I'll get to that in a moment. We'll ask our panel about that. I think his rise to political power in California had a certain inevitability about it. When he decided, with the help of others who encouraged him to run here in California, it was the beginning, in many ways, of 
the modern campaign techniques that we all now take for granted. But there was a breakthrough template that was established in those days. When I said earlier that I was asked to go out and cover Ronald Reagan, he was really in the early stages of the Republican primary for governor, working outlying and safe districts, San Marino and, and Pasadena, the conservative areas of the, of, of the valley. And most of the audiences had been pretty carefully picked so that he could, if you will, get his feet as a candidate. And he had a group of people that we all came to know pretty well on the bus with him who were taking stock of what he was doing on a daily basis and fine tuning the speech because it was different than giving a set speech for General Electric or appearing on television or reading your lines in a movie. Some of those names came to be very familiar in the world of, that brings us all to the stage here. One of them was a remarkable man by the name of Stu Spencer. Spencer and Roberts, uh, they had been running county political races before that, some state races as well. But they brought a new discipline, if you will, uh, to the idea of how you get a candidate elected. It wasn't just a bunch of cronies working out of a political clubhouse someday. It was very scientific marketing methods that we've all gotten used to now that they applied to it. And part of their secret weapon, in my judgment, was a young pollster by the name of Dick Worthland who would do these very in-depth polls uh, in the key districts here in California about what people were concerned about and what they were unsettled about and where they wanted to go. Now, let me back up just a step and set the scene for you. California in 1966 was at the end of a long run of expansion uh, the California Water District and the university system and the beginning of the prosperity that you had until very recently in California, uh, the expansion of, of the state. The governor was uh, Edmund G. Pat Brown, a formidable figure, and I also happen to believe not just an amiable governor, but a historic figure in California's history because he led the state uh, through the California Water District and the and the construction of the university system. He defeated Richard Nixon when he was running for governor here in California. But on his watch, Watts occurred, and the free speech movement blew up on the UC system. And a lot of people were startled by what they were seeing and the nature of the language that was spilling out over the airwaves at that time. And California's middle class, which had really shouldered the burden of building the state, was beginning to run a little bit out of patience. And frankly, in those days, you have the seeds of the Prop 13 movement. Uh, we all became very familiar with Howard Jarvis. We never thought that he would become the legendary figure that he was because he was always around the edges of any political year trying to get limits put on property taxes. But there was a willing constituency to have that happen. And a lot of people were unsettled with what was going on in California as a result of Watts Riots 1 and 2, uh, what was going on on the college campuses. And it was the beginning, the early stages of the counterculture movement. We were beginning to see the early days, for example, of Haight-Ashbury, and rock and roll was taking over, and people were pushing back against what I called the greatest generation, and their more authoritarian ideas about how families uh, should uh, live together and what, what careers are acceptable to people. So the conditions were almost perfect for someone of Ronald Reagan's political philosophy, his extraordinary uh, abilities as a candidate. But Spencer and Roberts, Worthland and Company, and the Kitchen Cabinet, a group of businessmen who were very interested in having Ronald Reagan as the governor, took very few chances. In fact, I remember uh, I was invited one day um, to an event uh, on Wilshire Boulevard at the Wilshire Abel Theater, and it was off the record. And what it was, in effect, 
was an out-of-town tryout for the Ronald Reagan campaign in California. They put him on stage, they had people down below, some of them brought in, and it was test marketing what he had to say and how he said it. And they would fine tune uh, that speech and his appearance during the course of that three hours. There was also a remarkably uh, almost front page-like character who worked for him by the name of Lynn Nofziger, who had met him earlier during the General Electric days. He was a conservative newspaper man from Ohio. He literally kept a bottle of rye whiskey in his desk drawer uh, in the campaign headquarters, and it's where the reporters could go and, uh, and have kind of head-butting sessions with him, but also uh, almost always get some insight from him. And the campaign was launched. Uh, now, the Democrats, <clears throat> in their own wisdom, uh, thought that Ronald Reagan would be the easier candidate to beat. They thought that George Christopher, the mayor of San Francisco, was the one that they really wanted to have the nomination. They thought that he would be a more formidable candidate. And they quickly learned that the state was going in an entirely new direction. And I must say that there was a what you could almost describe as a beyond electrical environment in that campaign. It was at flashpoint constantly. Ronald Reagan uh, stood his ground when it came to the students. Sometimes his remarks were ill-tempered. If they want a bloodbath, let it come, he said at one point. Um, he, he talked unlike any other candidate that they'd heard in the state of California but he was touching nerves all over the state. And the other part of it, I always felt, was that he could get away with saying more outrageous things than other candidates because in the next breath, he would be folksy Ronald Reagan. He would be that guy from Main Street who seemed like one of us who lived next door, however harsh some of his rhetoric. In fact, I, uh, I have pulled up some on my iPad um, that are worth hearing, I think, again, uh, from that time. There's a, uh, thank God for Google. Um, <laughs> here's what he said about his appearance before an audience. He was talking about appearing before large crowds. I discovered that night that an audience has a feel to it. And in the parlance of the theater, that audience and I were together. When I came to actually presenting the motion, he was talking about his early days at Eureka College on a student strike, there was no need for parliamentary procedures. They came to their feet with a roar. Even the faculty members present voted by acclamation. It was a heady wine. Hell, with two more lines, I could have had them riding through every Middlesex village and farm without horses yet. That was on a 1928 student strike at Eureka College. It gives you some insight into Ronald uh, Reagan. The students were, I think, fair to say, um, um, at Berkeley especially, uh, were setting fire, metaphorically speaking, uh, to the bridges that existed between those great campuses and the middle class and the state that helped build them. And at one point, Reagan said, I'd like to harness their youthful energy with a strap. <laughs> he said, um, a tree's a tree. How many do you need to look at? That's when he was talking about California's expansion of the redwood forest. <laughs> if it's a bloodbath, let's get it over with. Talking about communism, which was a much bigger issue in those days, and especially in California. We have a different regard for human life than those monsters do. Then later, when he was asked about his qualifications for being president, he said, I'm not smart enough to lie. <laughs> Some of you in the audience are familiar with the great line from Jack Warner, or at least attributed to him. When he heard that Ronald Reagan was running for governor, he said, no, 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 no. Jimmy Stewart for governor, Ronald Reagan for best friend. <laughs> Harry Ashmore who was a liberal who ran a study center at Santa Barbara, got it about right, I thought, when he said Ronald Reagan managed to change his image almost completely between the time he announced for the office of governor and the time he came into the home stretch of the election, a period of some two or three months. 
He came into the election carrying the image of Barry Goldwater. He emerged at the end of the campaign bearing the image of Nelson Rockefeller, moderate Republican. It was a, a campaign that from the very beginning, you knew that Pat Brown was going to struggle uh, at best. And Brown was perplexed by his inability, here's a man who'd beaten Richard Nixon after all, to even put a glove on Ronald Reagan. I remember at the end of one long day, Pat Brown, his receding hairline and his paunch saying, how does this guy do it? He's older than I am. I'm swimming every day, and he looks great every day. <laughs> and then the Democrats made what was a fatal miscalculation. They ran one of the worst television ads I have ever seen. It's Pat Brown talking to a group of young African-American students in Watts. And Pat Brown leans over to this young man, and he said, you know, Reagan's an actor. And the kid said, yes, I know that. And he said, remember, an actor shot Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Was there ever a rational explanation for that, Lou? <laughs> I remember. <laughs> yeah. They thought it was a joke. It was an actor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, I remember when it first ran, it had an electrifying negative effect for the Democrats. And I was just a young reporter. It was my first year here. But I went to the three or four A's, and I said, what the hell were you thinking? And from there on, of course, uh, it was Reagan most of the way, helped in part by a deeply divided Democratic Party, Democratic Party that had Pat Brown as the governor, Sam Yorty as the mayor of the city of Los Angeles, who ran and effect the conservative wing of the Democratic Party and didn't bother to hide the hopes that he had that Ronald Reagan would be elected governor. And he was, and I think that it's fair to say that the state had no real idea about what kind of a chief executive he would be, how commanding he would be, and how much attention he would pay to the day-to-day -day details. Not too long after he took office, I was in Berkeley, California for a meeting of the UC Board of Regents. And that was going to be the first public showdown that we were going to be witness to Ronald Reagan and his executive, the exercise of his executive authority. Clark Kerr was the cerebral intellectual president of the UC system at the time. He had been critical of Ronald Reagan. That Board of Regents, by the way, was one of the most powerful assemblages of people that I had ever seen before. They represented the Los Angeles Times, Buff Chandler. Uh, the Ed Carter from Carter Hawley Hale, Ed Pauley, one of the greatest oilmen in America, Norton Simon of the Industrial Fortune, and later the great art collection, of course. Um, and Clark Kerr asked for a vote of confidence from the Board of Regents. And Ronald Reagan, from the opening moment of that Board of Regents meeting, made it clear that he was in charge and that was not going to happen. And then we quickly learned that um, from Jess Unruh and Willie Brown and the others who were the Democratic posse in the legislature, that Reagan was a far different person to deal with behind the scenes than what we had been witness to out front. He was more inclined to find a pragmatic way to get things done. The two words you'll hear about him a lot are pragmatic and underrated. And that he was more pragmatic in many ways in dealing with welfare reform and dealing with uh, abortion rights even in the state and uh, trying to reorganize the mental health care delivery system in California. And then you begin to get the idea of how far this guy could go. In 1968, he made a short run for the presidency. It was not as full-blown as his later runs were. That was Richard Nixon's year. Nixon was trying to keep him at bay at that time. Um, 1976, he, of course, challenged Gerald Ford and did not get the nomination. Uh, the man who was helping Gerald Ford by collecting delegates and tallying the delegates around the country was James Baker, who I saw in New York last night. And Baker, to this day, said it's not 
entirely clear to him about why after he'd worked so hard against Ronald Reagan that Reagan reached out to him, or his team did, to have Jim Baker as his first chief of staff. I think it was pretty clear that uh, the Reagan team was not authority, afraid of getting the best help that they could in any circumstances. And then, of course, he made the historic run in 1980. And 1980 proved to be, for him, almost a mirror image of what he had gone through in California. The conditions were perfect. He was running against a weakened president in Jimmy Carter. The economy was in sh some shambles. He didn't have Berkeley to deal with. He had Iran to deal with at that time. Having moved from California to the East Coast, I would go around to my friends and say, he's coming. <laughs> I promise you, you will not say anything quite like Ronald Reagan when he decides to run. He stumbled at the start in part because his campaign was mismanaged by a man by the name of John Sears. They lost Iowa to George Bush 41, who famously said after he beat Ronald Reagan in a state that was his surrogate home state, I've got the big mo. The big mo ran out in New Hampshire when they fired John Sears, reorganized the campaign with the help of Nancy Reagan, and let Reagan be Reagan. That was the catchphrase at that time. And then there was a night that helped propel him toward the presidency in New Hampshire when he was going to debate George Bush 41 in, in, a, in a televised debate organized by a newspaper. And the other candidates who were running, including Howard Baker and Bob Dole, showed up on the platform. And the poor hapless newspaper editor, a man by the name of Mr. Breen, didn't quite know what to do, and he was going to shut off the microphone until they left the stage. And that's when Ronald Reagan leaned forward and said, Mr. Green, I paid for this microphone. That played out across the country the next day. You saw this man in a commanding fashion, and he went on to become the President of the United States. I'll conclude with just two stories before we get to our panel, because they have so many insights that I think that are reflective of him. Two years into his governorship here in California, um, I did a program in Los Angeles called News Conference. It was kind of a mandatory stopping place for political figures who came through. Bob Abernathy and I did it. Pete Wilson will remember that. We worked very hard at what we were doing and, and immodestly had a pretty good sense of how to put the candidates and the people who came through the public uh, officials uh, through the traps that they should have been able to run. We, we had Ronald Reagan coming in two years into his governorship. There had been a lot of turmoil at that point, tax increase, and, and, uh, and there was a whole issue about welfare reform. So we worked up a, a real choreography about how we would question the governor. Bob would open with one phase of it, and I would follow up with the next, and we, we rehearsed it in our offices and spent four or five days. Ronald Reagan comes in. <clears throat> uh, looking, as he always did, uh, impeccable, completely at ease, picks up a Life magazine, tells us a story about an idea he'd suggested to him one time. And I'm sweating bullets at this point, because I know this is going to be mono mono with Ronald Reagan. We open the program. Bob has the first question. I have the next one. We follow up. We just rat-a-tat-tat. We're going after. We're boxing him on the right. We're boxing him on the left. You know, we're cutting him off here at this side and we're correcting him when he makes a misstatement, and we finally get to a commercial. And I'm mentally exhausted at that point. <laughs> I'm looking down at my notes, and I thought, I wonder how the governor is doing. And I look up at him, and he was looking at the shine on his shoes. <laughs> I had not phased him in any form or another. We'll have an opportunity to talk about the presidential years and how he got there and how he conducted himself. I'll just, if I can, leap forward to leave you with one other story about that. I had the last interview with Ronald Reagan before he left office. Uh, it was on a Friday uh, before the inauguration of the new president, his vice president, George Bush. And it had been very carefully arranged. We were doing a much larger documentary. It, um, I wanted to talk to him about his childhood, about his formative years, about how uh, life began for him, because I think those are always important kinds of keys to the DNA of people. Uh, when he learned to read, his relationship with his mother, and we gave him advance warning that th that's what it would be about. 
I was the only person on his calendar that day. And uh, Ken Duberstein, who was the White House Chief of Staff at the time, called me and said, uh, the interview will start at 11.30. The camera crews will be here at 10. They'll set up. You'll arrive at 11. You'll be made up, and you'll sit in the chair and await the arrival of the president, who will enter through that door at 11.28. Sit down. He'll be fully made up. You microphone, microphone him in two minutes, and then you have 30 minutes to conduct the interview. At noon, straight up, you thank the president. The president will thank you. He'll stand up, thank the crowd, the crew. And then for reasons that we don't completely understand, he wants to take you out onto the patio overlooking the Rose Garden. You'll be there for four to five minutes. Then you'll come back in the Oval Office. You'll have the team photo. And then he'll exit that door right over there at 1215. It went off like clockwork. At 11.59, 59, I said, Mr. President, thank you very much. And he said, Tom, thank you. Turned and thanked the crew. And he said, Tom, why don't we go out into the Rose Garden? And I said, what a wonderful idea, Mr. President. Let's do that. <laughs> and so we went out into the Rose Garden. And we were standing there on the patio. And the cameras started appearing, the White House staff photographers, and taking pictures of us. And the president, who was not much given to small talk, with especially members of the press, uh, leaned over to me and he said, you know, Nancy and I were talking this morning at breakfast. You were there from the very beginning. And I said, I was, Mr. President. It was such a privilege to ride around on those buses with you and San Marino and other places, and now to see the complete arc of your political career as President of the United States. Looked at me, put his arm over my shoulder, and whispered into my ear, it worked out pretty well for both of us, didn't it? 